animal, the lion, and the child, representing three different aspects of the spiritual path as, as we awaken to who we are. Each one of them has an element that we can use for our awakening. The camel represents perseverance. The camel is that part of the stage of our development where we load up ourselves with the spiritual teachings, right? We walk into a Science of Mind church in 1972, and Moy and I load ourselves up with the teachings of Science of Mind. We take all three different classes. We absorb every prayer technique, every meditation, every Course in Miracles book we can get our hands on. We are just filling ourselves up with these teachings, learning that there's a much deeper place we can live from than where most of us have spent our lives up until that point. This particular part of the stage of our growth is sort of the where do we begin to work with our mind? And we begin to realize that we do not live life from the outside in. We live life from the inside out. Things are not happening to us. They're happening through us. We co-create. We're part of an energy flow that moves through us. During this time, we load up our camel for the teachings and techniques that we will need to go through the difficult times when we feel the desert of separation moving through us. We will need techniques that we can move into and touch and deep places in us that we begin to find inside of ourselves. Resources we didn't know we had before that come forth and help us move through our life. Often during this camel period, we might find ourselves geographically moving to different places. It was certainly true for us. In 1976, we moved to the farm in Summertown, Tennessee, an intentional community where our six-year-old daughter and four-week-old daughter, we gave up everything and we went to the farm. We lived there for six months, and I worked uh, on the compost truck, picking up compost. We then moved to Evanston, Illinois a few moments later, and, and there, the theme is growing, I was uh, a horse stall cleaner. I cleaned up horse poop. That was my job, that's what I did. And then when we moved to Boulder, Colorado, I was a trash truck driver. I was working with my old garbage. Yeah, working, taking care of stuff, cleaning things up. That's part of this stage of our development. In 1984, when our child died of a terminal illness, we got to open ourselves up to our hearts breaking, very young in our lives on the path. We got to load up our camel with a lot of courage we didn't know we had before that difficult situation came upon us. We said last week that courage comes from the root meaning word core. It means literally to come and stand by your core, to come from your deepest place of being. And sometimes it's in those difficult situations where we're able to come from our core. And if it hadn't been the teachings that we'd learned while we're in the camel stage of beginning to learn that life was not happening to us but through us, we might not have made it. So that courage develops when we touch that deeper well stream of love inside of us. And then we can do and be an encouragement to other people. We can show them that you can get through this. We have. We, we know that there are places inside of us that are much deeper than anything that happens outside of us. This all happens in the camel phase, and you're never done with that. You don't move from one phase to the next and somehow think you're done. You'll always be loading up your camel with new techniques, right? So you can become fresh and alive and keep your practice fresh and alive. You'll go deeper and deeper and deeper into the well of your own being. That's part of the camel phase. And then we go into the lion's part of it, where we begin to own our power and authority. I thought I'd pull out a Charles and Myrtle Fillmore book, since I haven't quoted from the Fillmores in a long time. I'll let you know that the Fillmores are one or two people who formed the Unity Movement. They're still around. Then they're still around, too. Yes, they're right here, right now. And this comes from the Revealing Word, a metaphysical Bible dictionary. And it says in the lion part, about Revelation 5, 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion that is the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath overcome to open the book and the seven seals therein. Don't get me started on the seven seals, which are the seven chakras in our energy system. The root of David, the lion's roar, coming from that place of authority, begins the journey of awakening when we step up to the plate and have courage. It says, in Fillmore's interpretation, the lion symbolizes courage, fearlessness, initiative in life. We must have the courage to enter fearlessly into the overcoming life 
and into the understanding of things not just seen, but unseen. Not just the things that we like, but the parts that we don't like. That lion's authority, when you speak with that lion's authority. It is said that in the zoo, even in captivity, when the lions roar, when one lion roars, all the other animals are silent. Do you feel that? Yeah. One powerful presence speaking and roaring from a knowingness quiets everything. It is said that when the Buddha moved from being just Siddhartha or a man but became awake to the Buddha nature, when that awakening happened, every lion in every jungle all over the planet roared simultaneously and the whole planet was quiet. Isn't that an incredible image? of that kind of power and authority when you and I speak from that? It said that Jesus is one who spoke with power and authority. When he spoke, the world was quiet. The world listened. We learn to deeply connect to that kind of power and authority inside of us when we do our work with the camel. We load ourselves up with techniques, and then we begin, when we speak, to speak from a place of fearlessness and courage. Speaking not just for myself, but speaking from the presence of God within me. That is a huge, powerful moment when we speak with that kind of authority, is it not, in us? That's the, that's the lion in us. And then we come back to the innocence of a child. And in the Bible, in Mark 10, 15, it says this about our children. It says this, that childlike innocence. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, which I call the, is called in Aramaic, the queendom of Allah, which means the kingdom of oneness, that's where it comes from, from the Aramaic, of God. The kingdom of oneness, as a little child, will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, and he laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. And I bet he was blessed by them. It's a return to that place of original innocence, that childlike innocence, not, not childish, but child like. I've just had the gift of having two eight-year-olds with me in my house. My granddaughter is here. You saw her come from the doorway. And her friend Nicholas is with her as well, too. And it's so fun having them come. Initially, there's kind of a resistance. Oh, the kids are coming. There's so much work. No, no. There's so much joy to have them around. They come and it's like, let's just have a great time. Let's do it. Let's enjoy life. Let's throw the first day. Let's play a game. Let's dance. Let's do Zumba. Let's do life. We went to the beach yesterday with them. And when they enter into the, the queendom of Allah, the queendom of oneness, when they come to the beach, they've got their buckets and they've got their little backpacks on. It's like, look at this beautiful day. It's the beach. Let's go swim. Let's go boogie board. Let's have a great time. And I'm right, right behind them going, I love being with children because they're innocent and holy and in wonder. A childlike innocence that we bring to our teachings and to this moment are so powerful. They propel us to return to something we've left in our adulthood, thinking we have it all together. That childlike wonder and innocence of being young again. The Buddhists call it Zen mind, beginner's mind. The Christians call it, for unto us a child is born. In the Krishna Hindu tradition, it's the flute. Krishna playing the flute by the milkmaids, yes? It's that sense of presence of being alive today, enjoying everything there is to enjoy about life coming back into the moment over and over and over again is a great spiritual practice. And it's one we'll be engaged in the whole part of our lives. It's not just having a whole bunch of techniques and principles in the camel stage or speaking with authority. It's being childlike and innocent at the same time that opens up the heart. My, my encouragement for this particular teaching today comes from a very dear friend named Carl Anthony. Most of you know Carl Anthony. We speak jokingly, Carl's the only person I know who has a bigger ego than I do, um, next to Barry Dennis, the three of us are pretty equal. But Carl is an amazing being who's practicing, like I said last week, opening up his heart and going deeper into the well of his own being. And we just spent Tuesday of a couple of weeks ago at this beautiful spa. It was a wonderful day. We soaked and we'd gotten saunas and we were just completely and utterly and thoroughly relaxed after a day of just being present and soaking and relaxing. And we were sitting in the lobby waiting for Maureen and our friend Karen to come and join us. And we were just in that place where it doesn't get any better than this. You know that feeling of being totally relaxed and completely present. No irritation, just open and innocent, purring like a kitten, just doing great. And then Carl 
picks up his phone. That's the first problem. Phone, the iPhone. And on it, there's a message from his office. And, and the message says that there's a $90 charge from the Brighton Bush Hot Springs retreat for our staying at that particular place that night. That night, Tuesday night. We were in Seattle Tuesday night. And Carl said, well, I canceled that reservation three weeks ago. I'll just call the Brighton Bush community. There's been a mistake. You make a mistake, you take it again. He calls up the people who we know really well. We've been coming to that retreat center for some 30 years. We know people by the first name basis. And he gets on the phone and he says, hi, this is Carl. Can't wait to see you. We'll be there tomorrow. Great retreat coming for 30 years. And he says, I've got this uh, charge on my, my credit card and I'd like you to take it off because I canceled it three weeks ago. And the woman on the phone, the woman on the phone says, well, you know what? Um, we'll give you a voucher for the next time you come. Um, we can't give you any money back. It's, it's in our policy not to do that. And so I'm listening now to this, and I, I'm no longer sitting peacefully now. I'm, I'm no longer in the lion's authority. I'm beginning to do what we all do, rant and rave. The big difference between ranting and raving and the lion's authority will be a line you'll walk your whole life. And oftentimes what happens, one gets substituted for the other, doesn't it? I claim I'm speaking from Alliance Authority, I'm using all the right Bible quotes, I'm, I'm hitting you with the Course of Miracles, and the truth is I'm just ranting and raving, and I'm calling it something deeper than that. Anybody know about that one? <laughs> we all do that. So I'm listening to Carl, and he's still staying on the camel, you know? I've I, I faced difficult things before. We'll work this out. He says, well, can I talk to somebody on the phone who can maybe give me a different answer? Okay? <laughs> and so we're waiting now, and he's got waiting for the person to come on the phone. And now I'm in my ranting and raving sort of section of energy. I said, let's see now. We have been coming to this retreat center for 30 years. We bring 70 to 90 people here for 30 years. We write them a check for $25,000 every time we leave. That's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they won't let us cancel a reservation because they have a policy. That makes, and you hear what happens when you do that? I'm not in the flow anymore. I'm ranting and raving and I want to be right. And I'm certainly at that moment not happy. So Carl gets on the phone again with the next person. And this person, he knows really well. First name basis with 30 years, we've grown up together. And he says to them, yeah, so, so what you're telling me now, let me, let me get this straight. You know, you know when you say that line, let me get this straight. What you're saying is you guys don't do any refunds ever for anybody for any reason. She said, no, no, we give a voucher, but I don't need the voucher. I, I, won't, I won't be coming back any other time except for this retreat. So what you're saying is you should let people know on the phone, if you make a reservation here, you will never get a refund. Even if it's, a, and she said, well, th that's kind of what we're saying. He's going, okay, then I get what you're saying. And he's, he, he, I could feel him breathing, coming back to practice, coming back to his core. You know how you do this when you practice. He goes, well, We'll talk to you tomorrow when we get there, and we'll just do some eye contact, and we'll, we'll be with each other one-on-one. -on -one. And, uh, and she said, have a wonderful trip. And he said, I will. And she goes, I'm sorry you know, for this inconvenience, but the truth is, it's really not our problem. It's your problem. Whoa. And the truth is, that's true. It's not anyone's problem. It is your problem, period. Right or wrong doesn't matter. It is your problem. We were, met, we were fine 40 minutes ago. Now it's our problem because we have made it our problem. I've made it, my, I've made it a problem that now must be solved. <laughs> we get off the phone and we're laughing and we're crying and we're gnashing teeth. We're staying centered. And we play it out for a while. You need to play it out for a while. You don't just get over it very quickly. Sometimes for me, I need to act it out as if the illusion I'm involved in was true. So for a while, we rant and we rave. We play charades. We go back and forth. And then we pretty much play it out within two hours. That's a miracle. Within two hours, by dinner time, four hours later, it's like, it's just money. What difference does it make? We'll treat it as a tithe. We'll give the voucher to somebody else. And I'm really fine until Carl tells me, oh, by the way, I didn't tell you. It's also going to be on your credit card as well. <laughs> That's $90 for Maureen and $90 for me. That's $180 on my credit card. It was OK when it was Carl's problem, but now it's my money. And you know how it is when it's your money. Right? And there it was again. You want to come from your core, 
Stand by what you know to be true, or do you want to get all caught up and wrapped up again? The choice is always before us. So the next morning we woke up, and it pretty much had played itself out, and we were pretty much done with it. We were ready to just be there. We had our stories. We were going to tell them what we thought was the truth of the moment. But we weren't caught up in it anymore. And while we're driving up the mountains in the Brighton Bush, the phone had cut out, and then it came back in again. And Carl was sitting on his, on his own iPhone, and he, he starts to laugh, really hysterically. He's just laughing. He's laughing, laughing like a little kid. I said, what are you laughing at? And he goes, you've got to hear this message. It says, Richard? Maureen, Carl, congratulations. All charges have been dropped. <laughs> All charges have been dropped. Do you feel that? What if you knew that that was true about you and your life? What if you knew that when you got to the doorway and you walked in with your guilt and your shame and your blame, what if you walked in and said, All charges have been dropped. The charge was your energy, bleeding in separation. Welcome back home again. What if we lived out of that place of innocence? Yeah, you are holy, innocent, guiltless, and shameless, and worthy of all the love that Cameron knows is true about us, right here and right now, to begin to live from that place. And the charge is in you. And you are in charge of one person's consciousness at a time. And that happens to be whose? Yours. All charges have been dropped. You are innocent, held forever pure in the holy mind of God. Yes, beautiful stuff. I love it when I can live out of it. So that was Carl being an encouragement to me, coming from his core. And that would have been enough. He was being holy enough already, staying centered, being in the Lawrence Authority. But it happened again a couple of days later. Have you noticed it does that? We're in the car again. We're on our way. This time to a Monday night. We've already been at the retreat. We're spending one night at this retreat center because we were both leaving, Maureen and I, and Carl from the Portland airport. We came into Portland. We leave from Portland. And Carl's on the phone. And he goes, confirming his reservations, oh my god. You know the OMG? <laughs> oh my god. How many of you say that? At least 10 times. Oh my God. Or, oh my God. To, oh my God. <laughs> or, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. It turns out somehow my reservation for leaving isn't from, from Portland, it's from Seattle. Five hours away from where we're going to be staying. Oh no. And now we've got to either get a, 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 a car and $150 to rent a car or $300 or change my reservation. And we're back to Oh my God again. But again, I've been through this before. We just went through it yesterday. You've been through things like this before. What techniques did you use to get through it before? Guess what? You can apply them again. And he just goes, OK, I will call and speak with someone. <laughs> and he gets on the phone. He gets hi, this is Carl Anthony. And what he says is an amazing teaching. I don't want to leave this out. I have to bring this in. He says, in that moment, he says, I have a situation. I'd like to change my reservation from Seattle to Portland. Can you help me with that? Yes? Not, you won't believe what happened. I made this terrible mistake, ranting and raving. You know, it's just awful and I don't have the money. How much is this going to be? And I really don't want to pay this. Thing. That's pleading. That's begging to God. Oh my God, please help me. I can't believe it. I've got this thing going on in my body. My relationship's falling apart. I have no money. Ah! And you put that out and guess what comes back? Ah! <laughs> When you speak and say, here's clearly what I need in the moment. That's power and authority. That's the lion's roar. I have a situation. Can you help me with it? Do you feel how that engages the, the universe to help you? Yeah, uh, can, can you help me? I need to just do a very simple thing. I need to change a reservation from Seattle to Portland. And the woman says, well, let me find out what I can do for you. Paul gets off the phone. And he doesn't speak about it again until the phone rings a half hour later. And the woman calls back and says, Mr. Anthony, we've changed your reservation for you. It'll be a slight $150 change fee, which wasn't a whole lot, about the same as a car to rent it to go that distance. And we've upgraded you to first class. <laughs> now, I like the happy ending. Yeah. I like to say, well, you just do this, and you do that, and you do this, and then that will happen. But the truth is, if you can understand what the truth really is, it doesn't matter what the outcome is going to be. You have touched something inside of yourself. And what the outside does or doesn't do is not your concern. You are just in the presence of something much greater. 
Less of summation, I'll stop screaming at you. I know it's late, it's been a long Sunday, but I had to get that all in because I think this is just amazing. <laughs> the, end, the end of our suffering will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. That's the childlike innocence of coming back at the moment over and over and over again. Right here and right now. That's the, that's the childlike way of seeing what's in front of you and enjoying it. Eating what you're eating and enjoying the meal. All charges have been dropped. You are innocent of all you have held against yourself or others. So here's another voucher to use for your next visit to the king and queen of oneness. Yes, here's the voucher. You can use this again. You've used it before. And finally, our last little bit of the camel from the camel, we learn perseverance that allows us to deal with the manual labor of working with our minds. Affirmations and denials and meditation and mindfulness practice, you'll never stop doing that. That will be the reserve that you'll build up when moments come where life gets difficult. Difficult. Two, the lion. We learn to speak from a powerful place of inner authority and strength. And we also learn to distinguish the difference between the ego's ranting and raving and the lion's roar. Three, from the child, we learn to turn our lives over to the innocence of our own pure heart. And then Jesus Christ in consciousness, when everything's in alignment with you, says, bring, bring this child unto me. And he places your innocence on his lap. And he blesses that innocence. And he is blessed by it. When you do these practices and bring yourself to this moment over and over and over again, you do exactly the same thing. It's a first class operation when you're in touch with the beloved God of your being. Practice well. Practice deeply. Not just for yourself, but for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Namaste.